Uh, Jan Volker is a research associate at the Institute of Fine Arts and Aesthetics at the Berlin University of the Arts and at the Collaborative Research Center 626 at the Freie Uni University Berlin. He's a visiting lecturer at the Institute of Philosophy Scientific Research Center in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and at Bard College, uh, Berlin. His publications include Aesthetic der Lebendigkeit, Kant's Dritte Kritik, uh, and in collaboration with Uwe Habakus, um, Neue Philosophien der Politischen zur Einführung. Uh, the work on Laclau, Lefort, Nancy, Rancière, and Batu. And I give floor to Jan. Well, um, thank you very much at first uh, for the invitation, and um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Am I loud enough? Am I loud enough? Oh. Um, okay, so at first I have to say I changed my title, actually. and. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, the problem with uh, my, my change of title is uh, somehow that it has been a result of what I've been trying to do. So in the end, I had to go back to the beginning and change the title. And um, this is somehow also a bit what I'm trying to, or what I will be explaining. Actually, I, I, I will be explaining why I, get, uh, why I got stuck and couldn't fulfill. That is the second uh, uh, alert I have to make. I couldn't fulfill what I uh, promised in my... Uh, abstract. So I got stuck on the way and the result of the getting stuck was actually uh, the change of title. This is a good way of putting it, I hope. I mean, you could also say I didn't I know, but leave it. I mean, okay, so my new title is actually Humanism as Being There. Um, yeah. So in... Nevertheless, I start. In contemporary theory, we are perhaps only able to think of humanism via its critique. Already Heidegger had declared that every humanism is based on a metaphysical concept of the essence of man, and it would be somehow preaching to the converted to engage in a critical debate on humanism, carving out its necessary essentialist understanding of the human. This concept, humanism, if it is a concept at all, cannot be redeemed without falling back behind a long development of a critique of this very concept, or else this falling back would be a voluntary fall, a sort of free fall, freed from the boundaries of critique, convinced in its belief that there is something more to the notion of humanism than its critique was ever, ever able to unfold. So, but already Heidegger had declared that every reversal of a metaphysical concept is in itself a metaphysical concept because it relies on the same basic understanding of thought as such. So to engage in a critique of humanism will not help us to get out of this loop. Any anti-humanism cannot prevent us from falling back behind its seemingly critical intention because with the notion of anti-humanism we are already in the midst of metaphysics and the work of critique would not even have yet begun at this point. Rather, the question is, once again, what is critique, if it is even possible at all? Thus, it seems that any reconsideration of the concept, if it has ever been one, of humanism brings us into deep trouble. Either we have to explain for which reason we can allow ourselves to fall back behind the long tradition of the critique of humanism, or else we have to understand the critique to not even have started yet and announce that a serious discussion about the notion of humanism has not even yet begun. Either we stick with the original understanding of humanism or we have to find a way out of this loop of criticizing the critique as not yet being the real critique. Maybe this is the alternative between being either stupid or else helpless, to be ignorant of the history of the concept, if it is one, of humanism, or to be at a loss with it. But the first alternative, as naive and ignorant it might sound to, imply, to simply ignore the critique of humanism, is perhaps not as easily to do away with as it might seem. In the contemporary discourse, this ignorance is played out quite softly. Instead of any discussion on the conceptual kernel of humanism, we rather continue to use the notion in an effective way, knowing that there are some difficulties about it, but nevertheless, we continue to believe that it effectively works. So we know 
very well that humanism might imply some es essentialist claim about the being of the human, but nevertheless, it, its offsprings help us to organize our understanding of everyday life. This is the ideological notion of humanism in the belief of the common sense. We know that it is not true, but we still believe in it. Every humanitarian action, every humanitarian imperative or humani uh, humanitarian need or humanitarian consideration displays this ambivalence. And even the discussion of the human rights brings this ambivalence only to its peak. And actually one can only appreciate the strength of this ideological notion of humanism. It not only has turned away from that ism that Heidegger criticized to be a sign of the reign of technology, this ism that for Heidegger indicated in the last instance the ineradicable alliance with metaphysics. So it not only turned from humanism to the adjective of something humanitarian or the human aspect, but it also has managed to immunize itself against any critique. As it is said, for example, commonly today, one might be critical of any account of humanism in general, but in the particular situation, one cannot oversee the humanitarian aspect of what is happening. So the actual use of the notion of the human that implies an understanding of humanism is precisely one that has immunized itself against, is it too high? Better now? Okay, I get, I have to manage how to see. Um, so the actual use, this was where I stopped, the actual use of the notion of the human that implies an understanding of humanism is precisely one that has immunized itself against any critique. This might be taken as a paradigm how metaphysical, and that is first of all, essentialist claims function today. They are not upheld in their old generalized sense, rather they are set into relations. And as relativized, no one could seriously contradi cr contradict the human or humanitarian aspect that is also part of the story. In this way of its functioning, the notion of the human bears some quite, quite some resemblance to another well-known incontestable signifier, namely that of democracy. Democracy, in its complete sense, as a notion, is hard to grasp, and therefore it is always set into a relation to the state, for example. So, these words of a generalized consensus that function via their generalized or function via their generalized relativizations. Although it might perhaps be ascribing too much the quality of an agent to these concepts, one could also understand this as a strategy of immunization. Words of the consensus immunize themselves against critique pre precisely because they are in general relativized. Immunizing them themselves, these words of the consensus manage to have their critique already anticipated and to have it dismissed in advance. There is then, or then there seem to be only two options to come back to the notion of humanism, either to criticize the critique or to immunize against the critique. Two problems arise actually from this situation. At first, a reconsideration of the concept of humanism on the one hand leads us back into a much broader discussion, namely into the discussion of essentialism or metaphysics and its critique. But second, there is not only an objective side to this, to, to this discussion, namely the question of what, what the notion of humanism contends, how its critique relates to this content, and what is, what is given as a content, for example, for a post-humanist concept. There is also, besides this objective side, there is also a subjective side to it, irreducible to the objective content and nevertheless objectively effective. Clearly enough, today's use of the idea of the human, of humanity or humanitarianism and of humanism is both objectively unclear and objectively effective. It is unclear because it exists only in, in its relational procedures but it is effective in these very procedures at the same time. Thus, today, one could argue a critique of the metaphysical, impl of the metaphysical implications of the concept of humanism is not enough. For this metaphysical concept has undergone an ideological change and any serious debate on the question of humanism will have to take both sides into account, whereby, for sure, one side is affecting the other. But this applies to the point of view of critique as well. 
to overcome and to criticize the essentialist and metaphysical content of the notion of the human will also have to tackle the ideological form of this notion. Because the ideological notion presents precisely a strategy to overcome an essentialist and metaphysical content by the way of immunizing. And thus, the critique of the ideological form of this notion needs to unfold an implication in all the various uses of the notion of the human. And this implication, the ideological implication, is in itself without a firm ground. The critique needs to unfold the subjectivity of the ideological implication. But to demarcate the subjectivity implied in the ideological use of the notion of the human, there arises a need for a, for a subjective stance on the side of the critical argument itself. Any critique of the notion of humanism will then in itself be bound to this effectiveness of contemporary ideology and will thus to have to take its own subjective stance into account. To uphold that there is an ideological subjectivity implied that is in itself groundless necessarily can only be a subjective, a subjective claim in itself. So if we start like this, we could say that the actual is issue behind the question of a reconsideration of the notion of humanism is not only the question of metaphysics and its critique, but rather the question of metaphysics and subjectivity. The first step one might take is to ask the simple question of what is at stake in the debate on humanism. And to anticipate the most obvious candidate at stake is the distinction not only between the human being and the animal, but rather the distinction between the human being as thinking being and the animal, or even maybe the distinction between thought and being. From this point on, we could obviously go back to Aristotle and follow the complete development of this distinction up to its most modern articulations and consider humanism, for example, to be a name that at a certain point in history arises, to name a far older problematic, or we could consider humanism as a specific constellation of this distinction, a specific formulation of it. But I would propose here to understand such an approach only to be an other variation of the question of metaphysics and subjectivity. And I would propose that the necessary first step is to unpack this constellation of metaphysics and subjectivity, and only then we are able to reconsider the history of this notion. That is to say, the actual point of beginning is here, in the contemporary critique or ideological use of the notion. <coughs> the problem is now that in one way or the other, the subjective stance implied in the ideological use of the notion of the human, nor in its critique, can be um, nor in its critique can be reduced to a simple affirmation nor to a simple negation. Neither is the ideological use subscribing to some essence of being, nor can the critique of it be reduced to a simple negation of that very claim. Thus, if the actuality of the notion of humanism is beyond simple affirmation and negation, negation we need a point to start at which the implied subject subjectivity is constructed in this very beyondness. Perhaps the best, now comes the, uh, the big surprise, perhaps the best example for this is Giorgio Agamben's book, uh, The Open. It is not even a book on humanism as such, although humanism is treated, but rather as that epoch of the Renaissance to which we also refer as humanism. But first of all, Agamben's book is a collection of small chapters that are gathered around the notion of the anthropological machine. Agamben understands this machine to have been producing the notion of the human, and it has been producing the notion of the human in a different way in the ancient times than it has been doing this in the modern times. Via the notion of this anthropological machine, Agamben thus unfolds a history of the distinction between the human and the, and the animal. Throughout the book, Agamben engages in a debate with Heidegger, and thus he engages in a debate with a critique of humanism precisely on the level of the question of metaphysics. So we might find a good start here concerning our question of the constellation between metaphysics and subjectivity on the one hand and the constellation between negation and affirmation on the other. The question is not only what is implied in the notion of the human and a possible humanism as its affirmative account, but also the question is what the possible terrain of its critique could be. <coughs> 
the argument in this book is unfolded through different areas of theology, philosophy, politics, biology, and art. The first point that is interesting here would be to find out what kind of argument Agamben is actually developing. This might sound easier than it is. One could say it's, a uh, it's an argument of philosophy. For it is not the easiest question on what ground Agamben actually combines a seemingly historical argument with a philosophical point. The density of the philosophical argumentation does not allow to misunderstand it as the history of the idea of humanism. But then again, the philosophical approach is impeded by multiple other discourses that are built into the structure of the argument. Clearly, they do not only serve to illustrate a problematic, but rather have a different status. Let us take a short look at one example directly at the beginning of the book. It seems to be not just by chance that the first three chapters present the following picture. The first chapter treats the illustration of a messianic scene in a Hebrew Bible, the second is on Bataille's notion of the Asephal, and the third, uh, the third chapter then is on Kojev. Both the very short chapter on Bataille as well as that on Kojev turn around the question of the uh, post, post history and what the human becomes in the post history. While Bataille's notion of the Asephal for Agamben opens at least a possibility to understand the post human as something that is irreducible to the animal. Kujav sticks to the negation of the animal by the human. Bataille, disciple of Kujav, seems to have been more closely connected to the problem that Agamben seeks to clarify, namely the animality of the human under post-historical conditions. Now, if one takes these three moments to be the beginning of the book, then the book begins actually with a jump from a messianic scene to a doubled understanding of the post-history. Post but both, the messianic as well as the post-history are notions of the negation of history. So the general scene we find in Agamben at the beginning of this book is thus one of the differences of the negation of history. And as I already alluded to, the further development of the book will then unfold an argument on the anthropological machine, and that is in the last, or in its most basic sense, a temporal argument. There is an ancient and a modern version of this machine. So we start from the end of history to go from there to the unfolding of the history of this machine. The argument develops from the post-histoire to uh, history. And it is precisely the status of negation that is the first question. This is the first question is, is the status of negation. Not only the negation of history, but also the effectivity, the actuality of this negation as either affirmative in Bataille's sense or negative in Kujev's sense. Some pages later, we find an explanation that we could also take as an explanation of this sort of beginning. And I quote, it's a bit longer quote, um, Agam from, from the open. Uh, the messianic end of history, or the completion of the divine oikonomia of salvation, defines a critical threshold at which the difference between animal and human, which is so decisive for our culture, threatens to vanish. That is to say, the relation between man and animal marks the boundary of an essential domain in which historical inquiry must necessarily confront that fringe of ultra-history which cannot be reached without making recourse to first philosophy. For this reason, the arrival at post-history necessarily entails the reactualization of the prehistoric threshold at which that border had been defined. Paradise calls Eden back into question." Unquote. <coughs> this means one has to start with the end to come back to the beginning and the proper beginning is a prehistoric threshold that only philosophy is able to grasp. The threshold between the animal and the human is at the same time a threshold between history and that which is beyond history. Not only is the distinction between the human and the animal endangered when it comes to the end of times, but the notion of history itself is blurred when the distinction between the animal and the human loses its clarity. And we already see that the anthropological machine is linked to the production of time and history as such. So before we proceed, we need to take at least a shorter, closer look at what Agamben defines as the anthropological machine. 
The point of departure is a debate at the end of the 19th century on the transi transition from the so-called man-ape to the human being. The biologist Ernst Haeckel assumed that there needed to be some form in between those two. However, the unsolved question in this picture is the question of language. And it is the linguist Heimann Steintal to whom Agamben turns then to show that this linguist is the one who tackles the question of the beginning of language as the sign of the human being, as a specific difference between the animal and the human, already some years before Haeckel. And only some time after Haeckel's theory of the form in between, Heimann realizes the aporia. And this aporia is the following. Steintal actually understands language to be the specific difference and at first he argues that there is a, and I quote again, pre-linguistic stage of humanity. He, Steintal, had tried to imagine a phase of man's perceptual life in which language has not yet appeared and he had compared this with the perceptual life of the animal. He then tried to show how language could spring from the perceptual life of man and not from that of animal, unquote. Later, Steintal realizes that if he wanted to conceive of the origin of language and of man as the same origin, he could not understand the development of language to be a later part of the history of the human. Agamben now understands this to be the contradiction that, quote, defines the anthropological machine which, in its two variants, ancient and modern, is at work in our culture, unquote. This machine either excludes something from the human that is understood to be not yet human. This is the ape man understood as an interior difference in the configuration of the human. A not yet human human, a human being not yet being capable of language. Or, other side, this machine functions the other way around. The animal is humanized. Quote, the man ape, the enfant sauvage, or homo ferus, but also and above all the slave, the barbarian, and the foreigner as figures of an animal in human form." Unquote. A human animal not yet fully human. The first mechanism of the machine is what Agamben understands to be the machine of the modern, the latter one what he takes to be the machine of the ancients. The machine of the ancients humanizes the animal, the machine of the moderns animalizes the human. Now the point is both variants of this machine produce a zone of indifference in which the distinction between the human and the animal is produced and that is always already virtually produced. What follows then, after a short reflection on Jakob von Uxkühl's description of the tick, which Agamben, by the way, understands to constitute a high point of modern anti-humanism and should be, I'm quoting, should be Rex to Hugo Roy and Monsieur Test, Unquote. So what follows after this discussion of the tick is a long debate with Heidegger. And from this long discussion on Heidegger's conception of the open and the structure of the non-consumment, which in the end leads to the idea of letting be and boredom as a constitu constitutive Stimmung of the Dasein, of the being there, I would like to focus only on the consequences or two essential consequences Agamben draws from it. And I think there are two uh, that are also taken on by Agamben. At first, in Heidegger, the animal is defined as that which cannot see the open. It is not capable of the open, although it is at the same time set into the open Umwelt surrounding. But this Umwelt, its surrounding nature, is not accessible for the animal. This characterizes the animal's poverty and world, Weltarmut, it lacks world. The human being on the other side is not simply characterized by the ability to access the world, but it is rather the access to this very dialectic between the closure and the open, between concealedness and the non-concealed that defines the human being. Thus, the human being is actually defined as the openness towards the not open of the animal. And the sign of this capability will be the word, although the capability to have the word is treated in the book on the open rather implicitly, um, but I will come back to this later, or in a moment actually. The second moment is that Heidegger understands the dialectic between concealedness and unconcealedness as a political frame. In the end, it is the polis that is defined to be the place at which this dialectic happens. It is, Agamben writes, quote, 
because man essentially occurs in the openness to a closeness, that's something like a polis and the politics are possible." Unquote. Here we are at the point at which Agamben is able to demarcate a decisive ambivalence in Heidegger. On the one hand, Heidegger conceived of the conceives of the human as that which has to remain open for the closedness of the animal. But on the other hand, Heidegger reproaches, the metaphysics, uh, reproaches metaphysics to think the human only from the side of its animality. How can these two accounts be combined if Heidegger himself has to think the human as the sublation of, as the being open toward the closedness of the animal? Agamben's point, though, is not the simple ambivalence in Heidegger's argument. The point is rather that Heidegger's conception itself, or Heidegger's version of the anthropological machine itself, has been overcome by history, or more, more precisely, by the end of history. So Heidegger's variation of the anthropological machine may, have, may perhaps have been the last effective version of this machine, but its effectiveness has been sub suspended by the unfolding of history as its own end. This end of history begins for Agamben after the end of the totalitarianisms in the 20th century. After, their, or after they have been ending, Agamben states, and I quote again, man has now reached his historical telos, and for a humanity that has become animal again, there is nothing left but the depoliticization of, a human, soci of human societies by means of the unconditioned unfolding of the oikonomia, or the taking on of biological life itself as the supreme political or rather impolitical task." Unquote. Both variants of the anthropological machine collide and the total humanization of the animal coincides with the total animalization of man. The end of history, the post-history we are living in is the time of the aporia. It is the time of pure suspension. Let me add another short quote to fully unfold the paradox that arises here. Uh, Agamben again. If the anthropological machine was the motor for man's becoming historical, Agamben summarizes, then the end of philosophy and the completion of the epochal destinations of being mean that today the machine is idling. Unquote. As was to be seen from the beginning of the argument on, the flip side of the anthropological machine is the interruption of time and therefore the anthropological machine produces time in a more fundamental sense. The becoming historical of man is the production of time as such. So the question is, how can a machine that is constitutively producing time be overcome by a historical development? As was to be seen, the anthropological machine itself relies on a moment of indifference, and then, at this moment, we can understand this paradox only in the following way. The fulfillment of the telos of the machine is to bring its indifference to the fore, and this is, as we will later see, because it is a machine of being. The historical development of the machine is the development of the interruption of time, or the end of history. And Heidegger's version of the anthropological machine is actually a belated one, but this in some sense also doesn't matter because any concept of the machine will always already have been a belated one. To give this problem a different and more satisfactory answer, we have to take a step back to the beginning, namely to first philosophy or ontology and metaphysics as one of its figures. In Agamben's reconstruction, the human being has to open itself toward the close, towards the closedness of the animal. But this closedness is understood as the, as the incapability of the animal to be open towards the possibilities of its surrounding nature, its Umwelt. The animal is strictly speaking neither open nor close. It is open, but it is exposed to closeness, thrown into the world. The animal is deprived of its possibilities. Now, on the other hand, the human being then is precisely not understood as turning this incapability into a capability, it is not the turn from animal impossible, impossibility to human possibility. The human being is rather characterized by the deactivation of the impossibility of the animal. The human being deactivates the impossibility of the animal. This primal form of the possibility of possibilities as such, gained as a result of the deactivation of the impossibility is a potency that is at the same time a non-potency. And thereby the human being is both, 
defined by its relation to the closeness of the animal, but also by the deactivation of this closeness. The first potency of the human is a non-potency at the same time. And only the human being has the possibility to let being be. Or, as Agamben has it, and I quote, I quote again, in Heidegger's interpretation, the animal can relate itself to its disinhibitor neither as being nor as non-being because only with man is the disinhibitor for the first time allowed to be as such. Only with man there can be something like being and only with man there can be, uh, there can be something like being. And beings become accessible and manifest. Thus, the supreme category of Heidegger's ontology is, stating, is stated letting be. In this project, so in Heidegger's project, man makes himself free for the possible and in delivering himself over to it, lets the word and being, beings be as such." Unquote. If we translate this into terms of subjectivity, we might say at this point, the subjectivity at stake in this first instance is a subjectivity of letting be, a subjectivity which is at the same time not a subjectivity because it is only a deactivation of a non-subjectivity. But Agamben goes a step further. The human being has to let the animal be, and for the very possibility of this letting the animal be, the human being at the same time has to sublate it, to overcome it. But as or because the animal in itself is neither being nor non-being, it is outside the circle of concealedness and non-concealedness. So to let the animal be then means precisely to let it be outside of being quote again, but what is thus left to be outside of being is not thereby negated or taken away. It is not for this reason inexistent. It is an existing real thing that has gone beyond the difference between being and beings, unquote. The first conclusion Agam draws from this is that to render inoperative the anthropological machine cannot, ma cannot mean to find new ways of its articulation, but rather, quote, to show the central emptiness the hiatus that within man separates man and animal, and to risk ourselves in this emptiness, the suspension of the suspension, Shabbat, of both animal and man." Unquote. But as we have seen, our time is the time in which the anthropological machine perhaps is already inoperative. We cannot know it if it's already inoperative, but at the same time, it can only be our duty to actively incorporate this inoperativeness to risk ourselves to this emptiness. Let me try to summarize at this point. The human being is defined as that being that sublates and deactivates the incapability of the animal. Only from this point of view, the sphere of being as being comes into view. But this means to let the animal be a non-being. Letting be, which defines the human, means to let be what is outside of being. To let being be, is then related to the possibility to let be what is outside of being. Now at this point we might think, okay, this is then the definition of the human being, uh, the definition of the human being. To let the animal be a being outside being, whatever that means. But we saw that this letting uh, the animal be outside, uh, outside being, sorry, but we saw that this letting the animal be outside being is understood as a deactivation. It is a fundamental letting be. It is a foundational non-act, but also, at the same time, it is the very act of the foundational non-act. It is not only the definition of the human being, that is where I want to go, it's not only the definition, it is the definition of the human being, but it's more, it's also an ethical imperative. We need to let the being of the animal be outside, uh, be outside being if we want to be truly human. To be truly human is nothing else than the risk of the indifference between the animal and the human. An indifference that is never simply there. In fact, there is an ethical imperative that corresponds to the notion of being. This, cor this correspondence of being and ethics in the end builds the ground of Agamben's project. But it is a negative ground. I quote, Logic and ethics rest on a single negative ground and they are inseparable on the horizon of metaphysics." Unquote. Agamben wrote uh, or writes in the introduction to language and death, the place of negativity. And if in the future, quote, 
all metaphysics must collapse into ethics. The very meaning of this collapse remains for us the most difficult thing to construe." Unquote. And perhaps we are living in the time of this collapse, and this collapse would then be nothing else than the, quote again, unveiling and devastating arrival of metaphysics' final and negative ground at the very heart of ethos, human and humanity's proper dwelling place. This arrival is nihilism, unquote. Nihilism, as it is defined later in the same book, is the return of being to its own negative ground. But at the same time, ethos is conceived as the original dwelling of the human being, and thus the human being has its proper dwelling in this absent place of negativity, in the negativity of being. To understand why this ground is essentially negative, we have to go back to the question of the word. Ensuing from a long debate on the da and diese, the there and this, of Heidegger and Hegel, Agamben discusses in language and death the status of these pronouns in the linguistic sense, that is, in their relation to the system of language. Remarkable about the pronouns and other specific signs in language is that they primarily refer to the fact that a discourse is taking place. What they effect is the shift from long to parole. They indicate that not only there is a system of language, language, but that a spoken discourse is effectively taking place. The indication of this taking place is performed by a speaking voice. It is an uttered sound that this shift takes place. And at this, or as this very utterance, the shifters do not simply mirror the pure sound of a voice, instead, they already presuppose that these sounds form a reasonable discourse which is taking place. Shifters are not only articulated by a speaking voice, but they presuppose a different voice, a sort of second voice. This second voice, uh, I'll try my best. <laughs> this second voice indicates the taking place of meaning before, the, before any actual meaning, before the actual discourse has taken place. The voice, therefore, is doubled. It is the sublation of the voice as a pure sonorous flux, and it is the reference to the taking place of a meaningful discourse. Voice, in this sense, is a negative ground. Quote, it is ground, but in the sense that it goes to the ground and disappears in order for being and language to take place, unquote. Ground, the ground for something like a discourse to exist is fundamentally negative. It can only be grasped after the fact, but nevertheless, it is the necessary condition. In philosophy, this sphere, which is indicated by the voice, is the sphere of being, being as the ground of existence. But the voice, as actually taking place, is not only indicating being, it is also at the same time taking place in time and indicating being as its ground. And because it indicates and articulates this sphere as something that has taken place before the voice is taking place, the voice discloses both being and time. To put it differently, in the voice, being and time are indistinguishable. Both are referred to the same ground, namely pure negativity. Against this background, metaphysics and negativity cannot be separated. The voice, Agamben argues, is the general mode in which metaphysics has artic articulated the relation between nature and culture, between physis and logos, but the voice is a taking place of negativity. If we go back to the opening question of the paper, and this is actually my conclusion, and I hope I uh, can squeeze it in the last minutes I have, uh, namely through the question regarding the relation between metaph metaphysics and critique as one first ground for an examination of humanism, there is only, there's one first possible answer that is actually rather harsh and of a broad scope, which Agam himself actually gives. A critique of metaphysics cannot be based on the ground of negativity because negativity is the very ground of metaphysics itself. To put it in the terminology with which I started, a critique of metaphysics is useless because metaphysics is always already critical of itself. It has actually been criticized before it began. It is, in this sense, even the affirmation despite critique. Here we can see that Agamben is faithful to Heidegger, who was convinced that the only way to get to the point of the truth of being, to, to this very point, which had been forgotten by metaphysics itself, that the only way were to ask in the middle of the rain, 
of metaphysics, precisely this one question, was, what is metaphysics? Um, uh, may I try to skip a bit here. Um, Okay, so if we take this point, there might be two questions that can be asked here. First, whether this development of being that implies the development of its own negation provides any space for a theory of subjectivity in Agamben. And second, if this understanding of being is meant to say that there is an ongoing repetition of the same cycle of being and its negation, or to put it differently, what is the place of history in this cycle? To find the place for a possible answer, we might have to turn to the question of philosophy on the one hand. Namely, how can or can philosophy at all grasp these processes of being? On the other hand, we will have to ask the question of nihilism again. From which point of view is it possible to state the fulfillment of the becoming of, the becoming of being? For a metaphysics has been able to think its own ground precisely in the notion of the absolute. The absolute is what is thought beyond oppositions. And this is then uh, what philosophy actually does. It undergoes a process at the end of which it will come back to itself. I quote, only in this way can thought finally be, a home, be at home and absolved of the scission that threatened it from there where it always already was. Thought, unquote. Thought comes back to its own beginning as a pure and absolute split, but it can only come about as the result of this split that it already had been in the beginning. It is a process, philosophy is a process, and an experience that has to be made to enable thought to come back to the root of this very experience and to grasp it in its purity. But what about the diagnosis according to which we are living in the age of nihilism? That we are living in this age in which the uh, inner unfolding of the negativity of being has come to its peak, that is the age in which being goes back to its own ground. The time of nihilism is also the time in which philosophy, philosophy itself comes to an end because philosophy is nothing else than the thought of the negative ground that the voice indicates. It is nothing than this very process that parts from the split voice and returns to it. So if I have another five minutes, I would be that is no longer oriented towards the voice. But it would have to be a different thought. It would have to be a thought, Agam argues, that is no longer called by the voice and is no longer abandoned to death by this very voice. But at the same time, this experience, to be in sight language without being called by the voice, this experience is by Agam also called the most habitual experience to man, namely his ethos. How can this be understood? For Agam, the voice in its origin is pure will, but the voice he, sh he writes, does not will any proposition or event. It wills that language exists. It wills the originary event that contains the possibility of every event. The voice is the originary ethical dimension in which man pronounces his yes to language and consents that it may take place. So even if the voice wills the originary event, this does not necessarily imply that the voice is itself the originary event. Rather, if this willed event is the condition of the possibility of all events, then this will of the voice is an ambivalent state between the originary event and its absence. If the voice takes place, it is already wit witness to the originary event, but as a will that wills this taking place of itself, it is not more than a bet or a wager. But it is a wager on being, and the affirmative yes implied in it is an affirmation of nothing that will um, of a nothing that this will unfolds as being. But then being as the negative grounds needs the affirmation to unfold. The affirmation of the voice is so to speak a yes to the negativity of being. And it is a yes to the transcendental wager of the event of being. So if we recall, and now I really uh, stop myself, if we recall the re or recall one last time the place of the voice, then we could say this quasi-transcendental voice as the condition of every utterance has always already taken place. And thereby it is also, this we can assume, inscribed as the originary dimension into every particular act of utterance of discourse. It is the wager that time and being are distinguished via the simultaneous articulation. It is the wager that the event is possible as the performance of this event. 
the voice, so to speak, is a negative transcendental that can only ever have already been indexed. And if the voice is at the same time the articulation of the distinction between the human and the animal, between physis and logos, if it sets the anthropological machine into play, then to think the voice in its absolute groundlessness is to think the humanism, to think the thought of the human. Philosophy is able to think this thought as its absolute return to the very first split from which it arose. If you won't give me another minute, so I have to stop, I guess. I, then I stop here um, and try to fill in my conclusion in the discussion. Thank you, Jan, um, for this mapping of uh, being and thought, being beyond being, and the voice coming as a chief differential of becoming human. Are there any questions uh, in the audience? We don't have much time, but still. Please. Um, but there was, ah, you have I, I have, yeah, I just kept it. Um, um, I, I want to understand m more precisely how you situate the voice, because, uh, I mean, it, it's highly complicated, because the first move that you made saying what is properly human is to let the animal be, say, outside of the distinction of human and animal. This would be my reform reformulation of the outside of being, right? Um, so let the animal be outside of being the non-human, right? Outside, outside of the distinction. And one could say, in this sense, the act of letting it be to use Zizek's terminology, some, somehow like including out what is otherwise excluded in, right? Uh, via the distinction between human. And then I thought the voice is precisely this. The basic, let's say, condition for including out, letting the animal be outside the distinction of human and animal, of what is usually excluded in, namely the animal is that which is not human. But is, it, is that the case? <laughs> I mean, uh, then, then I get somehow lost, because, um, because you said the voice is properly human, right? The, or, yeah. I mean, or not. I mean, this is what is, I don't get. The no. problem actually is that, that what Agam tries to, try to, I mean, the argument as it runs in, in, in uh, is that the voice is doubled. The voice is doubled. I mean, the voice is probably human in, in some sense because it, it is like the position of the utterance of a discourse. I mean, you say something. So, and even the animal like utters a sound or so. So this is one voice. But then there is like in this, let's say, I mean, now of the terminology, you could say like in the moment of a human utterance of this voice, there is an implication of another voice that always, always already has been said. And this is the meaningfulness of a discourse is indicated to take place. That is what he says, like what the pronoun actually does. You, you utter a sound, you utter a sound. You utter a pronoun, you indicate that you here are speaking a meaningful discourse. Uh, and the uh, the the... The joke about the pronoun is that it does not refer probably to anything. It doesn't have a, an objective content. It only refers to the um, to the um, taking place of of the discourse, and so the voice in this point is doubled. And this somehow, I mean, I would I would uh, go along with the first uh, reformulation or, or um, yeah reformulation of, of of this problematic, and. Um, but then, I mean, then this, the, the, the problem is somehow that the question arises, okay, the second voice, to call it like this, or, um, yeah, or this uh, second understanding of the voice, to what, what does it really indicate? And um, for him, for Agam, it indicates the sphere of being. So this is, um, being is indicated in this kind of voice. And uh, the whole, the whole. I mean, to now I'm trying to fill in my conclusion. I would like, <laughs> but now I mean, the whole, the whole problem that comes about is then that he says, okay, if metaphysics is one way of thinking this voice, and if metaphysics as a development of being leads to the end of times, namely nihilism as the unfolding of the inner negativity of being, uh, 
what comes then? I mean, like, how can we, what, how can we think of, of any change? And I think the, the, the general problem I have is that I think that everything which happens can only be a repetition of this place of the voice. And um, this would have been, I mean, like, uh, but I'm now I'm too far away from your question, but just to take it as a chance to yeah. outline at least the... <laughs> I mean, is there ultimate danger th that you see in this position that metaphysics is, because it alre always already implies its own critique, is auto-deconstructed? Yeah, but so, I mean, <laughs> but it's, that, yeah, yeah, it's auto deconstructive, but the problem that is it's being somehow. Yeah, that's it's being, that's the being of metaphysics. Yeah, I mean, it's auto deconstructive, yes, but at the same time, this is it's being, and therefore, it's in the end one. I mean, uh, yeah. No, I wanted to continue on actually precisely this issue of, of the voice because I, I, I agree uh, with your reading of Agamemnon, but maybe there's a point where I actually read him differently, and I think the problem is with, with Agamemnon rather than with your reading. Um, as you answered to, to Frank, my impression was that uh, you identify two voices in Agamemnon, and that's language and death, right? And I agree with you when you say that, in a sense, the second voice is a kind of like negative indicator of being a la Heidegger. But at the same time, my impression was that you tried to put together, even like in, in terms of dates, like the very early Agamben, so 78, uh, language and death, and that which the open opens, that is to say, a thinking of, po of positive biopolitics, which is for me, I mean, as a close reader of Agamben translator, disastrous moment for Agamben. Because yeah. hmm? clearly, like language and death is a beautiful book, it's a critique of metaphysics. And I like what you said when you said, basically, the voice is metaphysics. And that's Agamben at his best. I mean, this is where Agamben says very clearly in language and death, Derrida got it all wrong. Yeah. Because met metaphysics is already anti-logocentric. It's already a, 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 discourse, uh, a discourse of Fonet. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the book point. But, and my question for you would be, are you actually putting together the letting it be of being as formulating, formulated in, in, in the open with the good voice? Because my take would be, this is, this is not, maybe this is what a government does, he doesn't do it explicitly, but I think this is where the whole project of a government collapses because language and death already shows that there is no overcoming of metaphysics specifically through the voice, whereas the later Agamben thinks that there is an overcoming of metaphysics and the crucial notion there is the form of life. So just to sum up my point, do you think yourself or you think Agamben is putting together the, the, the affirmative biopolitics of the form of life with a kind of like positive voice? Um, I mean, <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's really a complicated point. Uh, to a certain extent, I would say, yes, I think in language and death, a certain program is prepared that um, can also be seen and found in later, uh, in later texts, even if it's not directly uptaken. But I think a certain problematic somehow continues. That is, uh, perhaps this is how I would put it. I think there is a problematic in language and death, which is even if the point against, it's not only Derrida, it's also Adorno. <laughs> Uh, who have like who got it all wrong? Um, if there is a good point to say that metaphysics in itself is already based on negativity, and therefore there is no no need somehow to at least there is no need to criticize metaphysics on the ground of negativity. Then at the same time, I think this somehow okay. Let's put it like this: to a certain extent, there is an ambivalence in how far this. Uh, implies, let's say, a repetition of the sameness of the structure of being, namely the only ever ongoing self-criticizing the moment that has to unfold itself as existence, which refers to the ground, and so. Or if there is any possibility for a different account of history in this. And if maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe one could say like this, I, uh, I think when rereading the like newer text of Agamben, I think you could still say that he's still struggling with this problem or question, maybe. 
because there is a, a possibility to read the forms of life as precisely the unfolding of a certain formation of being. Metaphysics itself is also a formation of being to some extent. Uh, okay. uh, no, no, I just a comment. Maybe Aksana also would like to uh, put a question. I just have a brief comment about this uh, late uh, Agamben, early Agamben. Because actually, I think that he somehow rethought this uh, problematics of uh, uh, the language and place and negativity in his early book. Because, for example, if uh, somewhere, I don't remember when he does this note, he says that uh, uh, the, again, in, rela in relation to the, his book Open, he also used some elements of his argument in place of negativity, saying that uh, all these shifters, all these traps of language, when you say I, you're already captured by, by, by language, you're already put into this uh, discursive order. So he says that basically sometimes animals, they look are intuitively more smarter than uh, humans, they, they reject this trap of language somehow. So he somehow developed uh, in his current thinking this problematic, but in a very different way. I mean, not in the sense of uh, biopolitics, but ref still reflecting on this uh, link between uh, a a human, animal, and language. Uh, so, so it's, I think it's, so, so it's quite paradoxical so that uh, uh, animals, they somehow uh, had this strange primordial knowledge of danger could be associated with language and they try to avoid it. And also I think that generally Agamben, he borrows the same structure of, of his master Sinke Heidegger. I mean, in terms that he borrowed this structure of historical destiny. It's very, uh, in his analysis of biopower and uh, in his, uh, his later work, because something happened between Bios and Zoe in Greek antiquity, and this destiny occurred in the West. So this part is a Gambian also very critical because they sort of think in terms of destiny. Something happened, and we have these uh, problems and troubles uh, like for centuries. So it's, this sort of thinking is, uh, is, is, is what appears more in uh, recent Gambian's work, I think. But just a comment. But it's just just a very one sh one sentence uh, comment back on this. I mean, uh, on the other hand, you could also say that the question between like history and nihilism, unfolding of being and unfolding of nothingness, and being and nothingness is somehow at stake from the beginning on. And the the only ever played out variant is that in the end there is an ambivalence, there is an ongoing ambivalence between both. And my only claim would be that this ambivalence in itself is stable and therefore this problem like continues throughout. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's already in the, in the early, I would like. The point which is, I insisted a lot on this point. I mean, almost Thatcher makes the connection, and you're totally right. In this sense, like the two periods, uh, early Agamben, late Agamben, are connected. What, what does he say there? I mean, the history of biopolitics is the, is the history of nihilism a la Heidegger. I mean, this is like the fundamental connection between ontology and politics in, in Agamben. But where I disagree is about clearly there is a, a kind of like destiny, destiny in a Heideggerian sense. But there is also messianism, which is not so clear in, in Heidegger, unless you read the, the question of technology in a certain naive way. Um, but there is a very clear emphasis in Agamben about the radicalization of biopolitics, or more precisely, the radicalization of the state of exception. So, of course, Western metaphysics and Western politics since Aristotle have been both biopolitics and nihilism for... for, for, for um, for Agamben. But there are two defining moments, two events. The first is Christianity. So St. Paul positively, in a sense, radicalizes the state of exception and prepares the times for messianism. And then you have the second event in Agamben, basically, which is Nazism. So the, the way I see the history of being as history of nihilism, Heidegger, plus biopolitics in Agamben, is basically a radical... What we live now is a radicalization of the radicalization of the state of exception. And of course, the other huge problem with that is that there is a short circuit between Pauline Christianity Messianism and, uh, and, and, uh, and Nazism, because in a sense, the Messianic event par excellence is the Holocaust. Yes, I mean, just, 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 I mean, I, I think, or starting from where you started, I mean, just one point, I think the problem is somehow that the unfolding of nihilism 
and or going along these events you mentioned and going along in the radicalization of the radicalization of the state of exception somehow